as well. So as was kind of noted, I think chapter two of Genesis hones in on the sixth day of creation. Um, and chapter one, as you rightly read and suggested, both man and woman are made in God's image and likeness on the sixth day. Uh, when you get to chapter two, it kind of appears like, just from reading the passage, that there's some big amount of time in between Adam's creation and Eve's, but I don't think that's necessarily true. And I don't think there is nearly the variety of species we see now at that time. Remember, God made them according to their kinds. So it wasn't like Adam had to name every type of dog and every type of cat and every type of et cetera, et cetera. So I would just say, I, I hope this answers your question, both are made on the sixth day. And uh, chapter two is just honing in on the sixth day of chapter one. Yep. Also in the... Uh 2.4, we have the Toledot statement. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So there's a, uh, a uh, structural indicator right there that we're opening a new part of, of the text, of the, uh, the narrative. And that part expands on what has already been said about day six. Yeah, and I would also add, it also shows what is important to God. That, that obviously we got the whole big picture, but then when it comes to the creation of humanity, of men, man and women, woman, that's a big deal. So it's a way for God to kind of underline and highlight without doing that. Does that answer your question? All right. What is the relationship between Babel and Babylon? They have a similar religious system. Are they also the same spot? Is the name change something that happened when the language is changed? The city of Babel that we see being uh, constructed in uh, Genesis 11 eventually goes on to be the capital of the Neo-Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar fame. So it's one and the same. Atticus has a, oh, any other thoughts on that? Okay, Atticus has a question. Was Noah alive during the Tower of Babel? And if so, does the Bible explain his thoughts on it? Yes, he was. And we know this because of the, uh, the dates of when he got on and off the ark at 600. We know how old he was when he had, um, when he died which would be much later than 600. Uh, and we can count, uh, goodness, we can count how many years until Peleg, uh, who, in whose days the earth was divided. I take that as a reference to the Tower of Babel. So I think we can calculate and say, yes, Noah was alive during the Tower, Tower of Babel, but no, the Bible doesn't give us any of his thoughts on the Tower of Babel. But he was pretty mad. <laughs> He's probably confused. <laughs> <laughs> What's this noise all these people are making? <laughs> the poor guy had to endure two global judgments in his lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought it was tough having to do two democratic presidencies. <laughs> Sorry. Just kidding. All right, who's got, who's got another question? Anybody else? Oh, Jonathan, you had a good question. Uh, yes, uh, so when we were talking about um, God's promise after the flood and then the giving of the animals to man to eat, uh, it just made me think of pre-flood uh, when Abel was bringing his sacrifice before God. He was farming sheep, and I forgot that people farm sheep for wool, not just for meat, so I asked about that. Thank you for the, your answer. <laughs> And the, the other point about that that I think that you, actually you brought out in asking that I thought was very important is that it shows that the fact that they kept sheep shows that the idea of a sacrificial system was not only there, but also worthy of cultivating those animals. So I, I think it's, a, it's an important point that you don't almost see that as a, the, the, the shepherding of, or the keeping of sheep or an animal husbandry as a, as a mistake in the Bible, except that, I mean, certainly for, for food, but most importantly, it was important for maintaining their relationship with God in some fashion. So, um, any other uh, any other questions coming from the audience before I turn to the ones that have uh, been submitted beforehand? 
All right, let's see. I'm not sure how much overlap we're going to have across these. Uh, question one is, can you comment on one particular resource or influence that you regard as being most destructive in the general understanding of Genesis and one that is most constructive? So can you give a good and bad resource for studying Genesis or something to anything you'd particularly warn against or to stay away from? Well, I guess, I guess I'll begin. Um, this is nothing new, nothing that hasn't already been stated throughout this conference, but um, like any um, scholarly resource you may use for the Bible, it's kind of important to know that scholar's background and to be aware of where they're coming from. You might find a, a scholar that has certain good insights to say, but they're coming from a background that doesn't agree with us or doesn't subscribe to biblical inerrancy or authority. You have to be aware of that. So I, I would say it's, that could be a destructive place to start. And the best resources are those who hold to a, a literal, grammatical, historical approach to all of scripture, including the early chapters of Genesis. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that that um, with ben. these sorts of issues, Hello? There you go. They're right into it. With these sorts of issues, it's, uh, you, you never really know whether someone is coming from uh, an old or young earth creationism stance just by observing how they treat theology elsewhere. There are plenty of folks that are really solid theologically on a lot of points, but then get to Genesis 1 through 11 and all of a sudden are old earth. You've got guys like those that I cited at the beginning who um, in other areas produce good work, even guys like the, the Bible Project guys that make a lot of good videos, they would um, side with scientific consensus as well. Um, for solid resources that do affirm a literal normal hermeneutic, look at the QR code that I put on, on the papers. For good stuff, uh, my favorite commentary on uh, Genesis 1 through 11 was done by Jonathan Sarfarki. Uh, he's got some excellent work. Obviously, he's not inspired by God. One big point where he and I disagree is that he likes the metric system. <laughs> That's not okay. I don't like the metric system. <laughs> that aside, he does... In, uh, include other units of measurement in his commentary, so I'll let him slide on that. As for negative influences, as a, a rule of thumb, and this, this would go beyond Genesis 1 through 11, I'm finding whenever I deal with uh, various theologians and theological ideas, there are two types of disagreements that we can have, really even three. Uh, one big disagreement, which, we're, which theologians are most famous for, is disagreeing over what the Bible says. Right? Um, often it's not even disagreeing over what the Bible says, but how the Bible says it. Oh my goodness, I got in this long argument with the professor when I was in seminary over a particular verse. We both believed these two doctrines, and we were arguing whether the verse contributed to this doctrine or to that doctrine. We're not disagreeing about what the Bible says. We're just disagreeing on how the Bible says it, right? That's not a real disagreement. Sometimes we'll disagree over what the Bible says, right? Uh, we recognize that the Bible is the word of God. It seems to me that the Bible is saying this. It seems to him that the Bible is saying that, right? A lot of people who have a high view of Scripture think that a thousand years in the book of Revelation means a really long time. I disagree. That's another level of disagreement. Where we start to really, really, really get into the dangerous territory is when we're not disagreeing over what the Bible says, but what the Bible is. And this is what I find to be the problem with a lot of folks who are trying to force anti-biblical ideas into the Bible. We already brought the Bible project up, so I'll go ahead and throw them under the bus. First of all, they completely redefine the cross. They completely redefine what Jesus did. Uh, it, is, it is difficult for me to consider their view of the gospel to be within the bounds of what we should consider Christianity. They've got some good videos that are really beautiful. They've got some good things to say. But they have an obscure view of Christ. They have a very funky view of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. 
which isn't really a thing. They, they spiritualize both heaven and hell to turn spiritual realities. And then whenever you start looking at what they're saying about creation, they say that the biblical authors believed that the earth was flat, that it stood on pillars, and that the sky was a firm dome. Obviously, that's not true. Obviously, the sky is an expanse, which happens to be what the Bible says, by the way. And obviously, the earth is not flat, which the Bible doesn't actually say the earth is flat. But they're saying that the Bible is basically copying pagan myths around them, around the biblical authors, and they got the cosmology wrong, and God is using that to teach us something about himself, which sounds like God is trying to tell us that he can't get his own creation right whenever he's telling us stuff, right? Okay, so do you see how that is a dis disagreement, not over what the Bible says, but over what the Bible is? We believe that the Bible is God's word, that God created everything and he reported it accurately. Such theologians would say that the Bible is something different. It's just an ancient view of the cosmos, which is not entirely right. That's where you got to be careful. Yeah, I would also add to that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum has a wonderful commentary on Genesis that anyone who wants to study Genesis seriously should probably own, as well as Henry Morris's The Genesis Record. Uh, so those are great, uh, great resources to take. And I would also add within this that uh, even amongst those who are arguing for an old earth uh, viewpoint, oftentimes it's because they have some sort of apologetic desire. That is to say, they want to make Christianity sound or seem more palatable to a modern audience. And um, while the intention of that is good to try to take away certain, you know, objections that someone might have for the Bible, they don't probably realize how they're undercutting our own argument. And hopefully, you've seen that plain, uh, plainly. Uh, but I, I would encourage a, a degree of grace for our brothers and sisters who are, uh, even if they're misled or confused about that, to graciously hopefully expose them to the reality of how important it is to believe in every word of the Word of God uh, to that end. So, um, I think I had one more question here that was not redundant to what has already been asked, uh, and that is, let's see here, oh yeah, what sort of weapon did Cain use to slay Abel? So this is actually more fun than you would think. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, there's like a, a, a song, like a, a, a barbershop quartet that was popular many years ago where it had the line, Cain killed Abel with the leg of a table because it rhymes. But that's not true. It doesn't say that in the Bible. And then there is the, uh, the Facebook meme going around that we don't need gun control because Cain used a rock to kill Abel. Even if you don't have guns, you can still use a rock. Well, the Bible doesn't say he used a rock either. And then there are those who will say that the verb that is used to describe how Cain killed Abel is the same verb that you use for slaughtering a sacrifice, so as to say that Cain slit his throat in order to offer him like a sacrifice to God, perhaps in sort of a uh, sarcastic way. But the same verb is used for all sorts of killing besides sacrifices. So we don't know. I second that. We don't know. <laughs> I really, really was hoping that it was an AR-15. Okay, so uh, one, oh, one final question here, and I think this actually will be meaningful. Uh, if you are in the position to speak to someone who is, for whatever reason, Old Earth, whether they're secularist or a Christian, what is your favorite silver bullet example or reason for believing that the Earth is young? What evidence would you point to first for clarity of explanation as well as effectiveness? Can I be honest? <laughs> God's word. Um, I mean, it, if we reduce it to, do you believe that God is who he says he is? Do you believe that God's word is what he says it is? Then the authority is God's word. Remember, it's God's word versus man's word, and if God is who he says he is, then we should be just begging to know the truth of his word. And when we see what it says, that's authoritative, and that's 
what we should believe. And we didn't spend a ton of time talking about the internal evidence for taking Genesis literally, but it's, it's overwhelmingly on the side of young earth creationism. And that to me is really the strongest argument for a young earth. We get into all of this other stuff and it's meaningful, but really to me, God's word, the plain uh, understanding of it says the earth is young and that's enough for me. Just quickly, I would add to that, if I was speaking with a, a believer who also believes in the inspiration of the Bible, but believes in an old earth, um, I'm assuming that would mean there's something in Genesis 1 through 11 that they're not taking literally, or they're taking a, a non-literal approach to it somehow. You have to, because the genealogical record in God's word, Adam's you know, 4,000 years before Christ. So, um, But I think what's really powerful is in the New Testament, again, the New Testament authors assume a literal interpretation of Genesis, of the events of Adam and of everything else. So if you compromise on Genesis 1 through 11, it creates tons of other problems when you approach the New Testament. So I would probably refer to the New, New Testament author's quotation of Genesis as being literal. So this is where my testimony is, is different from what I think is normal. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was raised in church, but the church that I was raised in was very watery and uh, very attractional. It was fun, but uh, we had more fun than we had Bible study. So for the most part, none of us really got grounded in a biblical worldview. And by the time we graduated high school, for the most part, we were all apostate, myself included. Um, I'm a bit of a fluke because I returned to Christianity. <laughs> so whenever I was in college, though, I was a very outspoken critic of Christianity. As, as much as I'm, I'm an apologist now for Christianity, that's how firm I was against it back then. And I had a, a roommate in college that introduced me to this idea of young earth creationism. And he did so through a series of videos by a uh, young earth uh, apologist who, with whom I have a lot of disagreements over several theological issues that are somewhat tangent to the point. Uh, but I didn't really know any better back then regarding his theological perspectives. At any rate, so there I was, a very outspoken critic of Christianity, and the evidence that this particular uh, teacher was bringing up in favor of a global flood actually convinced me, while I was not a believer in Christ, that the earth was young. So I remained a young earth anti-Christian apologist for a couple of years, actually. Um, so the question was, what's the silver bullet? My silver bullet is go to the flood, right? That's where the real debate is. That's where the real stuff is. But at the same time, I want people to know the silver bullet is not enough of a silver bullet because you can believe in a younger earth all you want. If you're not believing in Christ, it doesn't really affect your worldview. So in that kind of a, a situation, I might point to this discussion through the flood so much as they're interested, but always remember that's not the big topic. It's Christ. Ultimately, it was the resurrection of Christ that got me to accept everything that Christ said. And by the way, being as how Jesus referenced a literal Adam <laughs> and the flood and all this, uh, we should take the uh, we should take Genesis seriously if we accept his resurrection. So the silver bullet for the question is the flood. But the, the, the silver bullet, I think, for the worldview would be the resurrection. You guys want to add anything for an unbeliever? Or I just, I realized I kind of, I split the question and asked really two questions, dealing with a believer, dealing with an unbeliever. Any yeah, with, with the believer, God's word, with the unbeliever, the gospel. I would also add, it, it's kind of an interesting thing that people don't often expect that I've had a lot of success with, at least in talking with unbelievers, is um, the reality that uh, we have all of these dragon myths and these depictions of dinosaurs throughout the world. And uh, so the, the ancient world, right, it's even uh, 
an animal on the Chinese calendar, right? All of which is roosters and monkeys. They're all real animals that existed, and here they throw a dragon on there. Um, it's, it's evidence that man walked with dinosaurs, as we said. I mean, they didn't call them dinosaurs. They called them dragons, as we saw Job depicted uh, a brontosaurus or some such type. Uh, it really causes people th to think, and it's even more interesting that uh, Carl Sagan, one of the most, uh, a very pronounced atheistic scientist, in, in ch being challenged to explain that, said, well, man had a shared genetic memory from when we were all mice rat, mouse rats or whatever we were, and we passed that down through thousands and thousands of years to then reimagine, right? We have cave drawings, paint, paintings of dinosaur shapes and dinosaur figures. And so what that does is it increases a little bit of disjunction into their world to say, why do we have, how do you account for all these wild dragon stories when there's no way, you know, in, in their worldview and cosmology uh, that they saw that. I think that's a meaningful, I don't know, I, I found it to be meaningful just because most even evolutionary, you know, thinkers don't, don't discuss it. So very frequently, the unbeliever is not equipped intellectually to handle that possibility. So any other questions before we call it a night? Okay. Well, uh, if we could give a warm hand to our speakers for this conference, we'll, and David and Jacob are now with us. And with that, I'll ask our uh, keynote speaker, Paul, to close us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the word of God that we can trust. Thank you for explaining to us the creator-creation distinction. Thank you for giving us a worldview that we can count on, a source of information that we can count on. Thank you for providing plenty of evidence that the Bible is indeed your word. I pray that you will help us all to uh, keep these things that we have discussed over the past few days in mind and that we will use them to improve our own worldviews and to reach our loved ones who uh, have not yet come to terms with who Christ is. In Christ's name I pray, amen. And just so we keep tradition, would you please rise and sing with us the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great week. And for you men, don't forget, there's men's breakfast on Sunday. Steve's making pancakes. Saturday, Saturday. Yes, Saturday. Good, good clarification. Saturday.